Hello and welcome to the walk off, everybody. I'm Scott Belford, joined by the best co host in the biz, Adam Mack, and very excited to have with us friend of the show, uh, the man who, when Adam is down and out, will pick up pick up the slack and join us as our uh, interim co-host. I'm so happy to have you back on the show, man. Joel Laflamme, welcome. Great to be here. Great to be here. Uh, playoffs was, uh, listen, rough start here for the New York Yankees. They going one and one against Kansas City, all of a sudden it looked like their backs were against the wall. And then the truth is Kansas City just really fizzled out there. Uh, you were kind of talking a little bit about it before we hit record, Joel. Kansas City. It's not even like the Yankees are a juggernaut. They just weren't good enough, right? Yeah. Um I this this baseball season is so strange because you have a team that was a uh, hundred games under five hundred, and what did that ripple effect have on Major League Baseball? Well, there's six teams left in the playoffs, and three of them come from the AL Central. Do any of them really deserve to be here? They're all like five hundred teams, and then you play the White Sox sixteen times, and you go fifteen and one, and you're that's your record above five hundred. That's pretty much how they got in, and now they're banging into. A team gets to go on because the fans play the uh, Tigers and you'll get a uh, an AL Central team that's probably not very deserving uh, in the um, ALCS. But then, you know, at the same time, I really feel like the, uh, the pedigree, the elite teams are probably coming out of the National League this year. Um, it does feel that way. Adam, I know that uh, when you look at the New York Yankees – you got to get around Soto. You got to get around Judge. Garrett Cole is a stud. And in a five-game series, that's definitely enough to kind of carry you through. And they proved that with the Royals. Does it matter who comes out of this Guardians Tiger series to you? Do you think the Yankees are just going to waltz through them too? Or do you think that they're facing a little bit stiffer competition out of the Central when it comes to the Guardians or Tigers? Uh, I mean, I think the Guardians are definitely the cream of the crop in that division. So... I mean, my biggest concern when Detroit went up 2-1 in that series was like, oh, they're going to like sneak past the Guardians and then roll over and get swept by the Yankees. And then the Yankees are going to the World Series fresh and like being able to line up Garrett Cole to go game one. And I was just so annoyed by that. So I'm thrilled the Guardians won last night and I hope they can pull it off because I, I still think they're more likely to win against the Yankees than the Yankees are against them. I agree. Like my, my biggest fear right now is that the New York Mets, the magic ends and the Dodgers wind up winning this elimination game tonight against the Padres. They waltz through the Mets. And then whoever comes out of this guardians Tigers series, the Yankees waltz through them. And then it's just a Dodgers Yankees world series, which Listen, I know that in the big scheme of baseball, you know, the the powers that be, this is a, a wet dream come true, right? Like a Yankees, mm. Dodgers, you couldn't have a more iconic, I guess, battle. But I think the only markets that really want a New York Dodgers World Series is New York and L.A., which are obviously massive markets. But I think everyone else in baseball is kind of cheering against that. We'll get into that. Listen, lots to talk about today. We're going to have a bit of a short show because Joel, Adam, and I are doing a bit of a writer's room after this here. If you're a Patreon member, you can stick around and, and follow that as well. We're going to talk about how Juan Soto, the rumors about him going to the Blue Jays are already flying all over the place. I'm already over it. I'm already over it, too. Uh you know, it's kind of that fool me once, shame on me, fool me twice. Uh, all right, it's the other way around. Either way, I think you guys get the reference that I'm saying here. So we'll talk about if this front office has a plan B, uh, if they don't get Soto. I mean, they freaking well better. Qualifying offers increase. How does it affect the Blue Jays? Spoiler alert, it does not, but we will talk that. Uh, Cleveland and Detroit, that series going the distance yesterday's game. 
one of the best games of the playoffs so far. So we'll dive into that. We touched on the Yanks getting eliminated or uh, Yanks eliminating Kansas City right off the top, but we'll touch on that again. And then if we got time, we will talk this big Dodgers Padres elimination game. Joel, Juan Soto rumors. It seems like the Blue Jays already being used as leverage. Of course, the names that are coming out are the Giants and the Mets. And obviously the Yankees are big in on them. I'm sure the Dodgers will even see if they can defer his contracts to 2060 or whatever it may be. Uh, That said, and I don't like this front office anymore. Um, neither does Adam. It took us a while, but over the last couple of years, we're pretty much on board with them not getting it done. That said, Mark Shapiro was able to talk Rogers into having a $700 million Shohei Otani budget and whether they were used as leverage or not, you can't go into those sort of, um, negotiations and not be prepared to spend the $700 million, right? So my question is to you, is there a Juan Soto budget within this Blue Jays uh, world? And not even if you think that it's possible he comes to the Blue Jays, because I think he's going to weigh his options. But my question is more so, how does this front office make sure that they are doing their due diligence to make a push for Soto? Because you'd be committing malpractice, in my opinion, not at least going for it. But also having a backup plan that is good enough to not kind of find you in a 2024 Blue Jays situation. I'm sorry. I know that was the longest fucking question I could possibly give you. But I think you get what I'm saying here. <laughs> yeah. Um, the the biggest loser in the Otani deal was second place. And that was us. Right. Mm-hmm. We cannot have that repeat itself. And the the instant rumblings of Soto just made me go, well, we haven't learned our lesson. The smartest thing here would be to be the first team out of Soto to say, we are going to look at everyone else. You guys bang your heads against each other to figure out who gets this guy so that we're not sitting there, you know, without the girl at the dance, right? There's you, you go to the 11th hour. You don't get to go to the dance with the girl. There's, there's nobody left. You got to go stag. So now are is there look, we we can make a run for Soto. Does Soto want to play here? He probably wants to play with Vladdy. But then how long is Vladdy here? Right? Like you weigh those options. If if Vladdy's not a generational talent, if we're not quote, gonna, unquote Mark Shapiro. Right. That's exactly <laughs> what that was. If if you're already making that move and, and, and Vladdy's not going to stick around, to s- it seems it seems like Vladdy Acuna. There's a good drawing point that two of them would want to play together. Tatis, you know, like, hey, I want to play with another similarly young, talented guy, and we'll spend the next ten years together dominating as a duo, right? Like. Mm-hmm. That's as close as we're going to get to a basketball super team getting formed is two of these guys with 10 plus years ahead of them, putting their, their time together and really trying to build something off of that. Like, but you know, imagine just Juan Soto signs with the Marlins just goes full LeBron James. It's like, I'm taking my talents to South beach. We're going to the Marlins. That would be wild. One team just expressed, like, look at uh, look at Texas going for Seager and Simeon. It's yeah. not the same thing, but it's like they're they were not even close to being contenders. And then yeah. they're like, but we're gonna hey, we get you and we're gonna go crazy. And sure enough, they win a world series within two years of that plan. So they're Seager and Simeon are already career happy now, their careers have been satisfied now, and uh, but. Yeah, I really, I think that there's this love affair that they want to be able to enjoy with the game. And that's it's playing with one another in some way, shape or form or playing for a contender that they really believe will make them winners for years to come. Right. So mm-hmm. I don't know if that faith, if I'm Juan Soto, 
and I'm hearing what the Blue Jays, te- what the players are talking about and saying about this organization. And I'm seeing the faces on the players and I'm seeing the consistent failure from the front office. That deal has to be so much bigger than, than anyone mm-hmm. else that is legitimately a contender over the next 10 years and offering me the same deal. There's isn't just some, I'm going to go play for the Blue Jays. You know, it's just, we're, we're Canada. We're not, we're not the prime historical baseball markets that you grow up and you attach yourself as a fan. Like you are in Canada. You got to do, you got to pay George Springer 40 million more worth to get him to come here. And yeah. So what does that look like for Soto? And does that make us a winner to overpay that much for one guy and then potentially not Vladdy, like you can't it is going. interesting. So a few things that have come out, I know John Heyman commented that the front office execs in the blue Jays system have said that they feel that what Vladdy and Juan Soto could be in the middle of this blue Jays order is very similar to what judge and Soto are in New York. Uh, no shit. So like, yes, of course, Front office execs are saying this, like, welcome to the most obvious fucking comment you can possibly make. Now, there's been some anonymous execs that have come out and said Juan Soto not necessarily all that concerned about winning. I mean, he does have a World Series ring with that Washington Nationals team. And they say that he's an ego-based guy that's going to go to the highest dollar. And if that's the case, maybe the Blue Jays do have a better shot. You know, like if, if you're just taking all Why, because the, we clearly also don't care about winning. <laughs> not to, not to uh, be yeah. overly negative, but that's kind of what I was getting at, right? Like, listen, this front office can claim a pretty big win if they land Juan Soto. They can let Vladdy walk. They can let Bo walk. And then we can just be a freaking mediocre team that doesn't ever really make the playoffs, maybe sniffs the wild card. I'm being very negative here. I just really, I mean, I know how good Juan Soto is, and I think he would be a huge boon to any team. But I do question if the front office of this Blue Jays team has it within them to build a winner around him. Is there enough money to do that? And maybe there is. Maybe that's the case. But we do all keep forgetting about the Mets. Like, the Mets are the biggest spenders in baseball. They took 2024 off of Mm -hmm. of the free agent market. And they're going to the NLCS for the first time, and that's bare minimum. So if you don't think Steve Cohen is going to be throwing his money bags around, I'm kind of with you, Joel. I think the smartest thing the Blue Jays can do is bow out gracefully early. Yeah, because all normally do with slugging right fielders who have defensive deficiencies. We we're going to we're going to sign Soto and trade him for a eighth inning guy who's kind of good <laughs> sometimes right is that what we're going to do here like we we don't even know i the last thing i want to do is bring him in and 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 just, like like adam said it seems like we could get three eric could, swansons for one soto Joel. <laughs> we, could, we could we could bring in a really, really talented player, but is it just to bring in a really, really talented player and that's it? Is their goal to be like, well, the single player and his pursuit of whatever he pursued in the next 10 years is more important than winning? And it, it yeah, I just, are, are we just magically going to figure out the draft and start bringing in young players that just really, truly su- succeed at this level? Like, I, I don't, I don't trust the front office with it. I, I think Soto is he probably played us a bunch, and he's like, eh, why do I want to? Why do I want to go there? You know, that's they, they they don't even look look egomaniac and all that aside. Like, I just don't think, I just don't think we're building the right type of baseball. We don't we we don't know how to build. We don't know how to build a team. We don't know how to build our stadium to help our team. We build our stadium in a way to draw people who aren't baseball fans to be able to enjoy the experience, not the baseball experience. Mm -hmm. All that's all that's wrong. If if you if that's in charge of your team, enjoy losing. 
because losing because winning doesn't matter truly adam i was thinking about how this team could improve with a plan b and the free agent market and i mean there are some really good options on the free agent market but I do kind of feel like if this front office lip service about contending is actually legitimate, the trade market might be the best route to go about doing this. Of course, I'm thinking about uh, the Oakland Athletics who gave up Josh Donaldson. Then they gave up Matt Olson. Or it's Matt Olson. I mean, they did give up Matt Olson, mm-hmm. but I'm talking Matt Chapman to the Blue Jays, obviously. Mm-hmm. Is, is there a world where we can start, you know, there are some high-end prospects Ooh. in this system and i know ricky tiedemann is undergoing tommy john um rehab over 2025 yeah. which means he's probably not pitched until 2026 sets him at 23 years old uh there is some guys like aralvis martinez who has a black mar with the ped suspension but he still has value as well trey yasevich the Blue Jays' number one draft pick overall who is already sitting at their number three prospect they did acquire some guys in the trade deadline when they were selling off their um, expiring contracts. So my question is, is there a deal where maybe, and I, listen, I'm blue sky in, this is like the best case scenario, where a Brent Rooker and a Mason uh, Mason Miller can kind of maybe be packaged together and we just throw, here's Ricky Tiedemann, here's Aravis Martinez, here's Spencer Horowitz, Here's uh, Davis Schneider. Here's Trey Savage, and just cross our fingers that, like, because listen, Mason Miller's a pretty big boon to the to the bullpen. Brent Rooker would be that power outfielder that we're just have obviously been lacking, and it doesn't need to be exactly that. But do you think there is a trade package out there where the Blue Jays can kind of fix some of these holes if they're prepared yeah, to yeah. give up? Yeah, you're not going to like this, but it involves Juan Soto. Mm. The the deal is the Yankees offer him $600 million. We offer six fifty because we have to overpay. And he goes, guys, just in taxes alone, I'm not going to make up the difference. You got to go 700 Give me Shohei Otani money, you know, asterisk, just for the ego of, of it all. Give me 701 and I'll come to Toronto. Fuck it. I'll come to Toronto. Let's Let's have a laugh, he says. And then the Yankees or the Jays go, ah, 50 mil, that's over our budget. And then they just make the trade to get rid of George Springer. They say, here's all of our prospects. Here's Tiedemann. Here's Manoa. But you got to take Springer and his 50 million. We get those 50 million off the books and we tack it on to the Juan Soto offer. And and, and that's the right fielder that we're bringing in that can slug. Okay. Okay. <laughs> all that. No, no, all no. That being, I, I like. That's that's my it. honest answer. Like, whatever. I, if we're gonna go the that route, let's just go all in. It, back to the one sort of thing for one second, and then we can move on from just, the one sort of thing. Because I know we get relatively almost the same production. Not like, sure. <laughs> I just, I'm I'm not actually like in in on Soto because I think again it's a waste of time. Like you said off the start, like oh it's like malpractice to not like pursue it. I kind of disagree. I'm kind of like you're the emergency room doctor. And you got to do a little bit of triage here. A guy comes in with 47 bullet holes to the face. You go, well, it'd be medical malpractice to not treat this guy. It's like, okay, we can like waste all our time trying to save a guy who's going to die. And then watch the rest of the hospital room slowly bleed out while we like don't get to them. Or we can go, okay, this guy's a lost cause. Let's save the other 47. And like, because we did that last year, we wasted all of our time and our wad on Shohei well, the rest of the free agency market died on us. I saw the reports recently that like sh- fucking Soto's friend is talking about like, yeah. oh, don't be surprised if the Blue Jays come out with this big offer. The best fucking thing Ross Atkins and Mark Shapiro could do to regain my confidence personally, which I know matters to them, um, is they could just come to a press conference right now and say, nope. That's not correct. We're out. Yeah. Like, we're, we're, they're fine doing it to Vladdy. Like, oh, leverage in negotiations. Maybe he is a generational talent. Maybe he's not. And we, like, apologize for them as a fan base and, and go, well, you know, contract negotiations coming up. Of course they have to, like, 
you know, posture correctly, and you, they can't just put all the leverage in his court by saying he's a fucking once in a lifetime generational talent. But we're not gonna have that same level of like restraint when it comes to Juan Soto this time. Like, yeah. why not? Come on. But Adam, I, my buddy's dry cleaner told him that Scott Boris is booking a Japanese restaurant as we speak. <laughs> right? Right? I know. Well, keep your dry cleaner's buddy away from Hazel May because <laughs> I can't sick. handle the rumors anymore. I'm over it. I was in the airport like in LA that day. I'm looking around. <laughs> I'm just like, yeah. Where is he here? Where is Shohei? <laughs> I can get on the plane with him and you can just like throw me out over Edmonton. Yeah. So, okay. So my, my, my last point on Juan Soto though, is like, we, you got to go all in and, and acknowledge that like, there is no cap to what we're going to do to get him. Mm -hmm. And like you just say, blank check. Here's a billion dollars is as high as we're willing to go. Like if that's what it takes. If you're not, don't fucking waste any time. Like there's no yeah. point. There's no point yeah. saying maybe we can do something creative with a 550 offer plus uh, a sponsorship deal with Uncrustables on the back end. Like fuck off, man. What what are we doing? I don't know. I'm over it. All right. So that is uh, Adam's first. I'm over it. Juan Soto talk of the off season. Uh, be and also for trade about, away George Springer. There we go. Uh, trade away George Springer. Be prepared for like 30 more of these. before. More of these. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, MLB announced uh, within the last couple of days that the new qualifying offer number is out. Uh, the qualifying offer for this off season will be 21.05 million. Uh, just a reminder how this is calculated. The figures calculated as the average of the top 125 salaries in Major League Baseball. So the qualifying offer last year was 20.325 million. Uh, teams have five days after the World Series ends to offer up the qualifying offer. So think about this. Shohei Otani's deal literally bumped that $1 million just on That's his own. Insane. And like, you know, insane. the top 125 guys are just like, oh, baby, let Juan Soto get his money. We're going to be making like $23 million on a qualifying offer next year. Like, <laughs> um, There's obviously – so here's the thing. I mean, not that I don't think any of the Blue Jays that were on expiring contracts were good enough to get a qualifying offer anyways, but – the Blue Jays did move most of them at the deadline. There isn't really a guy on the team where you're going to see that qualifying offer thrown out. But I will ask you, Joel, is it 21 million? That's that's almost a tipping point for a lot of these guys. No, like 21 million. That's a lot of dough. And I mean, I know that there's obviously going to be exceptions to that, like Juan Soto. Of course, you offer Juan Soto a qualifying offer. But remember when the Blue Jays uh, had moved Colby Rasmus and then he caught fire with the Houston Astros and they picked up his qualifying offer? I think it was $14 million at that time. Guys like Colby Rasmus, like, they're not getting qualifying offers anymore. That's safe to assume? <laughs> yeah, and there, there's an uptick towards not investing in players or like 32 it's so funny how you can go from like we'll give you 10 years to you're a one-year guy yeah you know like it's just it's like it's a matter of months between like 31 and 32 you're like oh yeah we'll get you eight years oh yeah we want to see this all the way through to 40 to like man you're 32 you're 34 a couple of ah, one-year deals man you're a one-year deal kind of guy you're like just like six weeks ago we were talking about seeing me through to 40 what happened and you got older yeah, yeah but what? i was gonna get older like what is, how is, what is this i don't understand you know so it's but it's really interesting where that tipping point is because the league gets there and they go long-term big time investment do we go all the way with you or do we go to the youth at like you know they're looking at some of these players at 29 30 and they're like let's just 
let's just recycle the deck here and and we'll yeah uh, you know we'll we'll see what we can get and, and maybe that'll be the one that we go and and the blue just really kind of feel like that rolling rolling off of a very veteran heavy team that got us to our last big playoff push about a decade ago and now to like building it somewhat internally with with Bo and and Vladdy and and hopefully Manoa but um you're at that place where where does a team like us pony up the big money for? where what does a player have to look like for the Blue Jays to say 10 year Bobby Witt deal Tatis deal Julio where what what play what does it look like for the Blue Jays to go I guess Otani Otani yeah we have to wait for another one of those who might be waiting a while um but yeah it's it's what does that player look like is my kind of question yeah, I'm really curious too, Adam. Well, while I ramble for a second, do you want to check mm-hmm. out how many qualifying offers were um, done last year? Because I'm really curious what that number is going to be in this off season. Like, how many guys get a qualifying offer? Because it might be, uh, I think it's safe to bet that it would be the lowest in Major League Baseball history. Like, what about those guys who have long-term contracts that are now lower than the qualifying offer? And they're like, Ugh. you're like, damn it. <laughs> you know, just, totally misplayed inflation. Yeah, 19.2 <laughs> a year. Without, I thought that was really good three years ago. And yeah, I just that's take, right. I took a bunch of one-year deals and I would have made way more money. Uh, seven qualifying offers last year. I wonder if it breaks five this year. Because, like, you know, like, if you look at guys like Anthony Santander, is he going to get a qualifying offer? You would think so. You would think so. Like. But also, it it does make you wonder, like, the Orioles, how much are they budgeting? Like, are they, and are they a team, too, that's like, you know what, we're so rich in prospects, we don't need a number two draft pick. I'd rather not get stuck with $21 million a year. <laughs> um, okay, so here's some candidates uh, through free agency uh, coming up this season, or this off season. Uh Juan Soto. Mm-hmm. Is, there a a downside sure. to, is the downside? Yeah. yeah, there's no downside to the Yankees no. throwing no. that out, right? That's a for sure thing. Um, Paul Goldschmidt. Made twenty six million last year, but he's thirty seven, and had the worst season of his career. Yeah, yeah uh, Tay no. Oscar thirty two. He made twenty three and a half million dollars this year. I'd yeah, say he'd be a candidate. Tay Oscar gets qualified. Okay, so there's two. <clears throat> um, hmm. Bregman with the Astros made twenty million this year. Yeah, I would. I could see the Astros. Pete Alonso with the Mets. Yeah, yeah, so there's four. I mean, I, I'd say Alonzo and Bregman, the only way they don't get a qualifying offer is if they just straight up get a deal before that comes up, right? So yeah, that's kind of a backwards way of looking at that. Um, otherwise, and then Josh Anthony Bell? Santan- Yeah, no, know. that won't happen. Like Santander is probably happen. the other one that's just on the fence, maybe. Depending Corbin Burns. The- yeah, 15 Burns and a half a million call. with the Orioles, yeah, 29 exactly. years old, he will. Yeah, if I'm the Orioles, you qualify off for him. Um, Labor Torres, mm, unlikely. Yeah. Uh, Jack Flaherty with the Dodgers. Again, like maybe. Maybe. Huh. Yeah. It's like he would sign know. a deal that'd be really close to that. Uh, Shane Bieber. Yeah, even 13, Shane 13 Bieber, mil I, this year. Was he injured this year? He got yeah, yeah. Tommy John. Um, Tommy John, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, it's uh it's gonna be interesting. I, it's funny because you have named guys where I'm like, yeah, you probably gotta qualify off for that dude. Like maybe it will be seven or eight, like Almost yeah. uh, almost Kikuchi with the running. Yeah, I was going to say Kikuchi, maybe. That's a maybe. steep price tag. 
It's it a steep is, price tag, but if you got to pay for one year at $21 million on Kikuchi, like that's what Bassett's getting paid. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's kind of the run. Like, did he earn it with, I think they went 9-0 and in his starts or something, right? Yeah. Like, Hilarious he never yeah. got a playoff start. To, to spend the prospect capital they did on him to not start him in the wild card. Wild. Yeah, they just won when he pitched. All they did yeah. was win when he pitched. Yeah. Okay, I know oh, that uh, Joel, you don't have a ton of time, so we're gonna we're gonna quickly, quickly talk uh, the playoffs, and then we'll we'll call that an episode, and we'll get to the writers' room here, uh, Cleveland and Detroit. We were talking about this before we hit record, but it might have been the game of the playoffs last year. Uh, this year, I should say. The only reason why I wouldn't say it was the best game of the playoffs is that. Uh, the Dodgers and the Padres series is that all the extra bells and whistles, you know, like the emotional anguish and the, the, the fans getting involved and like just the hatred between the two uh, cities that has kind of gone on. So I think there's been a couple games that are just like, I would give it to that series because they're just a little fiery, but there were lead changes. There were heroics by superstars. J Ram finally shows up. The bullpen, who looked overworked, somehow managed to pull it out. Uh, Detroit made it close in that final inning, only to watch Emmanuel Classe continue to just get strikeouts with his 102 mile an hour. Like, it was just an insane pitching matchup. Joel, who are you hoping for in this? Or do you even care? Um... I do care. That's that's a little that's a little harsh. I do care. Um, Who I'm, lines up best against the Yankees? The Guardians, I think, line up best against the the Yanks. Um, just the, the, they've the scrappiness of the way that they play. You, you see how they beat you, right? J Ram sitting there to to get a hold of one, but like yeah. the Quans on that team, the way that they scrap hits together and and. and uh, dropping down the bunt it's like they've it's like they're always playing postseason style baseball they're always playing this kind of really solid defensively keep you know the, the run prevention that they do along with the style that they hit creates and a Joel, let's let's talk that sack bunt for a second the the sacrifice squeeze because david fry was brought on two innings earlier Hit a home run, hit a two run home run, put the team back in the lead, then is up down, they're down again, and he drops down the sack bunt. Like, that's what makes this Guardians team so fun is that they're, even though David Fry, and I know he's kind of come out of nowhere this year to just be a stud, there's not a lot of guys who can hit a home run and then lay down a sack bunt like that, right? Like, just the way they play. I'm trying to remember the corner out nationals who did that in the World Series. Adam Eaton? Is that who it was? I can't oh, remember. Maybe Eaton did do that, didn't he? Right? Wow. I, like, I, the Rolodex of baseball fucking moments in your brain, Joel. I wish I could just get in there and. <laughs> I just, I always cherish those. If you can have a combo game of a bunt and a homer in a tight, meaningful postseason game. No, it's not just, much better than that. That's so baseball, right? That's just like, you know, the, the, you know, home run is the best thing that you could possibly accomplish. And then the sacrificial, and then it's, it's, this it's a suit. Like, he, yeah, the suicide he, squeeze. He, like what? Those things, you know, they, they can't just pick it up. They, they're going to come home with it. He's going to come, oh, safe. Oh, you're safe at first, right? So it's just like that that constant pressure that you keep on with plays like that, you know, and, and third baseman being on their heels because stuff's rocketed at them these days at like 109 miles an hour. So you got to be back there. There's just that lovely little area to drop them down and magic can happen. You got to make a – the pitcher's got to come make a play and pitcher's just – especially relief pitchers you think they're drilling these relief pitchers uh, 
the, the fielding aspects, they're coming in and they're their leg kicking <laughs> off to the side and they're like, oh, I have to feel. That's right. Like a lot of these guys, I feel a lot of relievers are probably really susceptible to just dropping mm-hmm. one in their lap and seeing them just roast one down the the line and you end up getting a triple out of it, right? So yeah. Like yeah, it turned it, out, it turned out to be the winning run in the game. Like it turned out to be the difference in game four of that series, and it's sending it back to Cleveland now. And this, I I I kind of I kind of feel like this the the suicide squeeze paired with the home run is like the baseball version of the Gordy Howe hat trick, right? Like it's the only like, thing you're missing there, because I was thinking this too while Joel Joel was talking. The only thing you're missing is that like Stephen Kwan, like nine pitch at bat. Yes. Like add that in there and that's your Gordy you know, Howe hat trick. Yeah. <laughs> Those elements combined, what they you 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 end up going one for two but like even in a nine pitch at bat the way that that affects that to adam's point it really doesn't nearly get the credit that it deserves to just Mm -hmm. i took an an inning out of this guy full inning off the bullpen arm yeah and like just the momentum swing of like the the team rallying behind in the dugout after that like honestly even to have like a nine pitch at bat that ends in an out is still like, I feel like should be a uh, one for one on the, on the stat sheet almost, yeah. you know, like, I don't know. It, it's, no. it, it's true. And um, yeah, it's, it's just wild to think that we're in such a low scoring era of the game. Pitching is so dominant right now. Offense is so low that we, that small ball hasn't, taken mm-hmm. more of a hold on the game where you need to you're at the end and you got Emmanuel Classe closing you out you need one yeah you need one run that's what you need you don't yeah. need the three run homer here you don't need the inning to keep going and scoring we don't need to put a crooked number up sometimes you need to put a straight number up mm-hmm. right and especially in the postseason and yeah you you do that and then class a comes in and shuts it down like you're playing for one and that's like i found myself thinking in the bottom of the eighth sorry top of the eighth runners on first and third with one out is there ever a scenario where the blue jays would have done a suicide squeeze and my response to that is no i don't think there is only far shows up maybe varsh Oh, I hope Ross Atkins isn't listening to this podcast because if I see 11 bunts a game next season out of the Blue Jays, we went all in on defense. Why not go all in on small ball too? Like, yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but man. that's not what I meant. That's not. I know. I, wasn't, I know. I know. You're right. Like, yeah. Like, hey, I don't necessarily see it that way. I just see it as a skill set that could be. Very valuable in the playoffs. Yeah, the, the, how, find out who who the bunters are on your team. You know, f- find out when you need late in in a game and you need one, and you've got speed on the base pass and you got a third baseman who his reaction time is kind of shitty. He's a little bit older. Hmm. That's a move, and. Uh, I don't know forever the team that looks down to third base and goes, that guy's not going to be able to handle a three, four hopper if I put it right where I need to. So, yeah, I don't know. It's definitely a tool that's just, hey, 70, 80 years ago, if you couldn't bunt, you couldn't play, right? Like, I I couldn't get over how perfect it was, too, with Quan at third, like the fastest dude. And the a guy at the plate with the ability to lay down a bunt. Uh, the the guy at first having the heads up and wherewithal to make sure that he is on the fucking move, right? Like last thing you need is a double play. Like it was just executed so perfectly. And I'm not a small ball guy. I'm honestly not. It's not the kind of baseball I want to see, but damn, that was exciting. Man, that was fun. And to watch the Guardian squeeze out that last run to save them in the end. What a baseball game. What a baseball game. Listen, I know that we're tight on time here. Joel, thank you so much for uh, laying down a a podcast with us before we get into some writing here. Uh, Mm -hmm. To all of you watching, we really appreciate you, Grounds Crew. Thank you so much. Drop your comments below. 
We'll get to those in Mailbag on Tuesday. Adam Mack, Joel Laflamme, I'm Scott Belford. This has been The Walk-Off. Uh, thank you so much, folks. Cheers.